Single moms. A horrible position that's not my problem. T2458 Learning Learning Corp Little Red Riding Hood Take One. Come in, it's the morning. Welcome, fellas. Man, I wish there was a simpler way to do all this stuff. Fade it. Good to go. Nice and easy. Morning. Uh, I guess you guys have heard the news. So I was gonna. I'm doing things a little differently this time, and I'm. It's because I hate doing what everybody else is doing. I want to say it was Twain that said that. When I find my opinions in the majority, it's time to change my opinion. And I was just something lately. Like, it's really popular right now to, to dunk on Tate, to dunk on Pearl, to dunk on, on the Fresh and Fit guys. And so I'm, I'm losing my appetite for it. But that's not what we're here for this one. This one is mostly sexual strategy within a marriage. And something else there, too. I realize we're... Everybody's kind of losing the plot. I mean, me as much as anybody else. And I get it. If you follow here from Twitter, you're probably seeing a lot of like nonsense, a lot of shit posting. And, you know, bless you for it. Bless you for it. Whose channel is Rule Zero on? It's actually Troy today. Thank you for reminding me because I have to redirect if he has it actually on on his channel. What do you think are the odds? I think he does. I think he does. There it is. I think it's this one. I think that's the right one. Yes, plus Passport Bros. We're going to talk about Passport Bros and then the cancellation thing here. I'm not going to waste your time there. For this one, I thought it was like time to tell some stories because it's it really was like a wonderful time between the 2012 and 2015 kind of red pilled era. I'm not going to say it was better because I'm going to explain to you why it wasn't better. And there was still just as much nonsense as there always was. But... At least you can give you a better appreciation for the red pill because I don't know. Anybody here has anybody here not gone through like the sidebar playlist or read the sidebar books? You know, the When I Say No, I Feel Guilty by Manuel Smith, the No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover, Practical Female Psychology for the Practical Man by David Clare and Franco. What are some other ones? Rational Male. Uh, Manipulated Man by Esther Villar, if I'm pronouncing that right, which I'm probably not. What are some other examples? Actually, you know what? The ones that I've missed so far is... I did Married Man Sex Life Primer. I did Sex God Method. Either way, yeah, required reading. Essentially, green light, you've absolutely got it. It is required reading. Let me pop out this chat, get you guys a nice... In nice splendor on my screen here so I can read what we're talking about. Yes, absolutely. Yes, Michael's story. Michael's story and Confessions of a Reformed Incel. Those are some of like the best work here. And it really is like all the problems. And here's the, here's the point. How long have we been doing this for? Four years now? Four, four years. Jeez. Four years now. And the problems have not changed. It's the same problems. It's the same people. The occasional ones that leave and new ones join up. And all this stuff has already been explained. So you can see how it's not really like, you know how everybody's thinking, you got to save young, like, no, you can't save anybody. They don't want to be saved. They want to sit exactly where they are and they want to be told that it's not their fault. Hotep Jesus absolutely did me a favor by showing me that old 1960s uh, email, or not email, but uh, mail marketing campaign. And that was like, it's, it's fundamental thing. Tell everybody whatever's going on is exactly what you're supposed to do. You're doing everything all right. It's somebody else's fault, and you'll be okay. That's exactly what we want here. Season four, Jesus. But yeah, Chris, yeah, so right. If you not finished them all, and I get it. It takes time. It takes most guys like, and if you're really like dedicated to getting through it, like six months, and that's the first read. Some people have to read it twice. Some people have to read it three times because there's always something new, especially with uh, Glover's work because covert contracts are like always the bitch. Anywho, and good morning to you too, uh, Meta Step. The part I like are the stories. So there was, and it's not because it makes you feel good, but it's because you get the best stories are the best examples of how to apply the red pill in your life. You know, one of my favorites, and I put it on my old blog. I hope and I put it in my new blog is, and I should, I should have pulled it up, but whatever. I remember it pretty well, is that the red pill even works when you're 52. 
And it was by this guy. He went by the, the pen name Older Pillar. And Older Pillar was in his 50s. The idea is he did, worked hard, had a wife. You know, they built a business. They had everything great. And he's like, all right, I am 55 or 52. And I don't want to die at the office. So I'm making a decision that I'm going to start doing. Like he's like scaling it back, working towards retirement, taking more, you know, time for this and getting the kids to take more of a leadership role. And his wife was a ball, like, no, workaholic, ball busting, whatever. And so he had come there and it's like, well, you know, we built this great life. I did everything right. I got rewarded perfectly. And now I can't bring my wife along with me to enjoy the spoils of our labor. What do I do? And that's he got into the same stuff everybody else did. You know, what am I doing that's a covert contract? What am I doing that's not assertive? What is there about the sexual marketplace that I am misinterpreting or misunderstanding or not looking at in a more utilitarian way? All that stuff, right? And so he did what everybody else does. You know, first thing, start hitting the gym, working out, looking better, dressing better, taking care of yourself, doing all the passive dread stuff, and then the active dread stuff. And it got to the point where his wife was in a position where it was like, you have to make a choice. I'm going to go and retire. You can join me or you can stay here by yourself. I mean, they had a main event. It kind of blew up, but she eventually is like, you know what? Let's do it. We worked really hard. Let's enjoy it. And that's, and this is where I came up with that, that wonderful tweet that's gotten so much negative attention from the exact type of people that it's aimed to get negative attention for, where I ask you guys, uh, I ask, how do you bring a woman to happiness? And I'm like, you have to drag her there, kicking and screaming. I'm still laughing at that tweet was like two years ago, and I'm still laughing because everybody's like, well, this is an invitation to tell them about all of my my childhood abuse. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> Some Marine is talking about dad used to put cigarettes out on him. Like, first off, how does this have anything to do with happiness? Second off, why do you think I'm your free therapist? And third off, by you being abused as a child, how does that make you win this argument against me that I'm not even having? But hey, it's the Internet. If you didn't, if you weren't, ex if you weren't expecting autism, you showed up to the wrong place. Yeah, exactly. Praxeology works for everybody as long as they're human. I think the difference is people misunderstand what you mean when you say works. Praxeology works in the same way that science works. You're like, science works? What about the vaccine and all the masks and none of that stuff worked? Yeah, that's not science in the same way that when people say work, they were like, I want to have a traditional marriage with a virgin wife and 10 kids. And that's not working. Working is you look at what's going on around you now. Same as the scientific method was just about building hypotheses and finding out what's not true and then making a theory out of what you can work with, like whatever's left. It's like, all right, it's the best guess we got because all of this stuff is wrong. Same thing with the praxeology. All right, women are like this. Men are like this. The technology and the landscape are like this. The social faux pas are like this. So if I do this, it looks to be the best way for me to navigate this with a maximum amount of contention and happiness, you know? And that's, and that's the stories I love because older pillars, that's not some big story about, oh, it was great. We go to church every day. Then one day she went feral and sucked 15 dicks. And now I don't know what to do. And then the end of the story is, ah, I kicked the bitch to the curb. It's like, no, it was literally a guy. Wasn't an incel. You know, he knew how to get laid. He met his wife. They had some family stuff together. They built a business. He made some money. All of that, you know, be the best you can be. Yeah, he was the best version of himself absolutely that wasn't his problem his problem was he had expectations about what he wanted out of life that were fundamentally different from his wife wives uh or his wife wasn't even thinking about it that way and he wasn't able to lead her to it and so the issue for him was essentially learning to let go look i am going to do these things because they are important to me now she's going to do them with me because she wants to be with me or she's not for whatever reason she can have she doesn't even need a good reason the sort of bill of rights work both ways. You don't need to have a good reason or a bad reason or any reason. You can change your reasons constantly. It's your reasons. That's how assertiveness, assertiveness works. A woman can change her mind at any time and a guy can change his mind right now. So yeah, that was his problem. And so he realized it. Yeah, my problem is not that my wife won't retire and enjoy the rest of her life with me. My problem is I'm refusing to follow my own best interest because I, I'm holding on to her as like my unicorn princess that will do what she's told and 
she'll want to do that. It's like, nah, it doesn't work that way, man. So yeah, older pillar had his, and there was another, and there's like tons of these ones. Another one was funny was, um, guy was 45 ish. I want to say his was good because he was married for, I don't know how many years. Let's just say 15. It doesn't really matter to the story anyway. And he, his wife had cheated. He decided he was done with that stuff. They got divorced. And now he's like, all right, I haven't dated since I was 19. So let's see what's up with this. And just like everybody else, he's like, you can't start pro. You got to start off in the Bush League. So he went out and did the online dating and did the normal dating. And he found himself a four. Why are you treating it like a success story if a guy's dating a frumpy four, middle-aged soccer mom? Like, well, when you go from zero to one, you can't really complain about the one, you know, like a starving man. Oh, this cracker is only a four. <laughs> it's like, relax, man. Relax. And that's how he built abundance. And it was like a great example of male self-confidence. I always hated how people treat self-confidence as if it's uh, if it's a blank slate. It's the same for both genders. Where women, because women have internal value. They're valuable because they're the bottleneck in evolution. They're the ones that make babies. Guys have a sex drive. That means women will always have the power in any sexual arrangement, right? Yeah. So for them, a lot of it is just a positive outlook. You just need to believe in yourself. You just need to be better at it. There's no real practical, you need to do this to solve this and that. You don't need to make decisions. No, a lot of the time it's not. A lot of the time they just have to get out of their own way and stop. I don't know what the feminine version of stepping on your own dick is, but whatever it is, they need to stop doing it. Stop giving themselves a mammogram. I don't know. <laughs> what is a pook? What is a Lizzo? Exactly. But guys, that's not how it works. So for us with confidence is we have to do something. And we have to like overcome some kind of hardship and solve a problem, you know, fix something, handle something, conquer something, whatever, whatever action verb you want to use. Right. And once you do that, then you get a little shot of uh, confidence. Well, it's dopamine, but it's confidence. And then from that confidence, you move on to other things. You, you, you're essentially leapfrogging over your own success. And that's how male esteem works, self-esteem. So that's why when it comes to the red pill, the first thing everybody is told is if you can't get started on a workout, don't even waste your time because it's the smallest, most uh, significant, the easiest and unfuck upable way for a guy to achieve something in his life is just by starting to work out. You hit your personal record, bam, a little bit of a confidence boost. You manage to go through an entire workout without getting winded, bam, little confidence boost. You manage to do a full chin up for the first time in your life. Bam, little confidence boost. You finally manage to do a squat without hurting yourself. Bam, little confidence boost. And then the idea is these initial kickstarting successes allow you to start branching into other things, you know, handling shit tests, handling fitness tests, boundary enforcement, all this basic, easy psychological stuff. I really should have been a doctor. Like I'm not going to school for eight more years. Fuck that. I've already done it for like, gosh, I guess I have done eight, two degrees, four and four. Well, three, so seven. I've gone to school for seven years, and all I got for it is two stupid bachelor degrees. <laughs> but yeah, so you get these ways, and this guy was the same way. He had his little four, and he's like, oh, I mean, it was something, which is better than nothing, but I wouldn't brag about it. And then he would keep going. He'd stick with her because she's a four, and he was a pretty good-looking guy, you know, middle-aged, and got his shit together. And all of a sudden, he's like, oh, so on his other one. And she's like, uh, five. And Jamaican woman. Oh, she's willing to cook for me. That's kind of neat. And then, you know, he had his little soft harem of fours and fives and he was happy with that. And then he ran into like his first, he called it a seven. This girl's actually pretty good. And he was a little bit, you know, a little bit butterflies in his stomach. And like, oh, this is a nervous talking to this one. And then he's talking to her and she's talking back and they're flirting and she's kind of getting a little bit difficult. And I remember he, he <laughs> it was the funniest thing to hear a guy talk like this where he goes, so I'm sitting there and she's running her mouth about something. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, it's like, yeah, she's hot. She's the hottest girl I've been with since the divorce. Probably if I get with her, but, um, do I really need all this shit? Like I can pick up the phone right now and call a girl, call the Jamaican girl. And she's not the hottest girl, but she'll, she'll make me something to eat. She'll give me a blow job. We'll have fun. I'm like, it's pretty good. And this is the part that that's not the part that I love. This is the part that I love. His entire demeanor changed. It was like Requiem for a Dream. The pupils dilate and the breath goes in and the blood starts moving. He goes, I get it. I don't care. <laughs> I do not care. I am not intimidated by her beauty. 
And he hadn't even read Pook. And he hadn't read 16 Commandments of Poon, so he already knew this. And he's like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. And so he started acting more assertively. He started realizing, like, these are just shit tests. I'm going to swat them away. And he didn't take what she said seriously. And when she was being extra bratty, he was poking fun at her, negging. And he was having more fun with it. And he eventually did get with her. And he goes, yeah, it was the greatest lesson ever. I realized, like, I understand why a lot of the guys, like Uncle Vaz and Whisper and all them, were telling guys to get a soft harem. It's an abundance that you just can't, you can't emulate. You can't pretend. You can't fake it. You can't just change your mindset. You can act like, no, what you need is to be sitting there in front of the girl that's you find attractive and thinking, well, my slump buster is like way easier than this <laughs> and have that change the way you act and the way you deal with people. And that's, that's literally outcome independence. I thought it was a great example of that. If I ever do a fourth book, on sexual dynamics, I'll probably pick like a bunch of these individual little stories. So yeah, it'll be good. Oh, right. At least one was paid by the Navy. That is true. Your tax dollars at work. It's holding up my lights right now for the studio. Uh, I see ADS 13. $7.99 Australians. Sub to your sub stack, your bundle of sticks. Love you. I'm, am I doing the right accent? Love you, bro. I saved $30,000. House be paid in five years. Hitting the game, too. Peace from Oz. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, too, you cunt. All right. Was that, a, was that a, on a scale of one to ten? How was that in Aussie? Was that good, Aussie? Or bad, Aussie? <laughs> uh, next is Gino. $13.99 Canadian dollars. Oh, thank you very much, sir. By the way, you guys... I am really glad you keep that penny because this is like a heartfelt free episode and I'm, I'm so far and enjoying it. Um, always found chicks can smell it when you're single. A low maintenance six always opens the door for an eight to come sniffing around. Oh, yes. <laughs> Me to step gives it an eight. Michael gives it crap. I was assuming it was crap because <laughs> I don't do accents of five. It's mid eh, mid. Um, yeah, it's not that they smell when you're single. And this is the part that I think a lot of guys think is funny. This is where you get those weird convoluted theories online, which yes, it's online. It's a theory. I get it. It's dumb where they're like, uh, if you've had sex, they put a scent on you and other girls can smell it. And it's like, no, no, no. It's, it's actually much simpler than that. It's when you're not thirsty, when you're not horny, when you're not desperate, you act differently. And the way that you act differently is attractive. This is why, for a lot of those guys who are never good with women, it's like, how come nobody cared about me until I had a girlfriend? It's because once you had a girlfriend, you stopped chasing tail. And then the tail started responding better because you started acting like a normal, confident man with options. Yes, it was one option, but one option is still an option. One option is still an option. <laughs> Sleeper gives me the heartfelt... <laughs> And it's a Jack Murphy article, not a Walsh article, for that terrible OC accent. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> I figure my Irish accent's much better than my my Aussie accent anyway. <laughs> uh, clap if you believe in fairies. Smash like if you believe in better red pill content for men. I mean, in fairness, it's kind of all that's going to be left here in the next six months after this election. Like, Pearl's going to be gone. She's going to be gone. Fresh and Fit are gone. Tate's going to jail. Like, who's left? There's Rolo. There's, like, the Rule Zero guys. There's me. We might just win by attrition. <laughs> hey, isn't this great? It's nothing but actionable uh, advice and information for men. How did that happen? Well, all the ass models got kicked out. <laughs> what the hey? What the hey? Venti destroyed Rolo. Nobody destroyed anybody. Keep the hammerhead shark out of the chat here. I don't want to bring that nonsense down on me. I have no desire to have an autism fight with a bunch of drug heads. Anyways, so this is the, and this is the point. I love this stuff. It's all, it's all stories. And I'm surprised how many people are like, well, there's no data to back this up. It's like, you don't need data. Data is not, first off, the social sciences suck. There's already a problem right now where when you get authoritative science coming out that's peer reviewed because that's authoritative because you know three people agreeing is much better than something being true and you're finding they can't replicate it 
I can come up with a study that says men and women this, blah, 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 that. I can do all the work. It can be properly p-valued. It can be peer-reviewed. It can be put into Nature Magazine, which is one of the bigger ones. I can do all that stuff. And it's still bullshit. I think it's something like 85% of the time. 85% of the time. That's not even 50% of the time. 50% of the time, you could at least say, well, it's a coin flip one way or the other. And that's like, okay, coin flip. Throw a dart at a dartboard, flip a coin, you know, consult the bones, whatever. But 85%, you know what that means? That means for any authoritative social science that you see and any conclusions that they come up with, you're actually better, pound for pound better, by doing the exact opposite of what the scientific literature suggests. Think about that. An entire field designed to be the Kramer of investing for science. Isn't that crazy? Sam Whiskey, $1.99 super chat. Sir, are you going to <laughs> Trudeau's divorce party? You know what? I, I'm, I'm not going to cheerlead it, but I'm not going to shed a tear either. I think it couldn't have happened to a better man. But I mean, he's known for a while. You guys, if you're not in Canada, we used to have like these montages of every time Trudeau tried to be affectionate with his wife and they're slapping and Sophie's slapping this hand away. Like, Get out of here. So it, it's been on the writing's been on the wall for a couple of years now that she's not into him and that he was probably schlupping the foreign affairs minister. Uh, what is her name? Melanie Jolie. Bit of a looker. She's post wall, but she's a looker. But I mean, so is Trudeau, right? Jim Kramer, not Cosmo Kramer. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to be the, uh, the other Kramer. You don't want to stick a fork in him. <laughs> if you know, you know. Uh, honestly, she really hammered how cyclical things are around here. When she first arrived, everybody was complaining about a different mixed chick named Brittany. Oh, is that that one over Christmas? That was, uh, uh, the black chick. The one looked like Scary Spice. I don't even remember anything about her. So whatever. Anyways. It's all, so what, what, and then you're like, what about the stories? Well, here's the thing with the stories. I, I've told people this and they don't listen. They hear, but they don't listen. Brittany Renner. Thank you where it's uh, low, low rigor, high replication. Like, do you know what rigor is? That's how thorough, how deliberate you are. You know, is everything, san is, are your tools sanitized before you use them? That's rigor. There's not much rigor when it comes to the red pill. It's just a bunch of guys telling field reports. There's a, a fast and loose uh, system, right? Talk about it in the present tense. Better yet, talk about it in the past tense. Keep the rule, keep the, the goals, smart goals, you know, something that's definable. Focus on things from a red pill lens. What's the utility for me? There's a very fast and loose set of guidelines on how to, how to do yourself a field report. And I've written about it before. Why are live chats not enabled when the stream is over? That's a good question. I thought they would be. Let me look. No, they should be. As far as I know, they are. Um, I do know this though. Sometimes when a stream, when it first goes off, the until it's finished all of its rendering, because it's got to re-render it in all the different uh, formats, until that's done, the live chat usually doesn't come on. So chances are you're just watching it too close to the end. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it takes like 24 hours. Social science. The closest one to science is economics, and that's Cappy. Oh, and economics isn't much better. None of it is much better. If you go down the line... There is like mathematics, which is still running 100% as best I can tell. There's mathematics, there's physics, there's chemistry, and then that line at biology. And right about there is when like we start losing the thing. And it's just, there's a limitation to science because as soon as a system becomes complex to a certain extent, you cannot narrow it down to individual variables. And the human condition and social interactions and macro whatever, or micro, I guess, micro interactions, I don't think you can. Like, I do not think it's capable of it because how are you going to narrow down? Use a simple example, the notch counts. You know, everybody's like, oh, if a girl has a notch count, you're basically this and you're basically that. It's like, you don't know that. You see a correlation there, but you don't know if it's true. Why? Because you cannot take two people that are fundamentally identical in every way with the exception of one has more notches. One slept with more guys than the other guy. Follow them for 40 years to find out how their marital bliss transpires and then repeat that enough times to be able to come up with a theory. You can't do it. It's impossible. 
So when you hear these things, when you hear these convoluted theories about notch counts cause this and this causes that, just remember it's not it's not about whether it's true because you you cannot know that. It may be true. It absolutely might be true. There's a correlation there, maybe there's a causation. Maybe it's the singular factor, who knows. The point is you can't look at it as if it's true or not. You have to look at it as if it's useful or not. Now, I would argue in a general in a general in general terms, notch counts aren't a helpful metric. They're not. I mean, partially because everybody has one now. And then serial monogamy kind of puts that in. So like you think about what's serial monogamy? Well, it's a girl. She never cheats. She never has Cancun phone parties, no threesomes in Vegas, no OnlyFans stuff. She just has a boyfriend. And the boyfriend lasts for three months, and then they break up for some flippant reason. Then she has another boyfriend for three, four months. She's terrified of being alone, so she's always dating somebody. And she's always attracting male attention because she needs guys. She needs the cue, right? So that's like four guys a year. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 6, 7. 8, 9, 10 years, 4 per year. That's like 40. 40 girls or 40 notches. You tell that to a guy, can you believe that? 40 notches. And you're like, Jesus, this hoe belongs to the streets. But no, she was baking cookies. She was baking bread. She's dressed conservatively. She wore turtlenecks. She never cheated on anybody. She never did any of that. Still a 40 notch count. So what did the notch count tell you there? It told you nothing. Nothing. Other than her ability to settle down and commit is just not there. Either she picks guys that don't want her back in the long term, or she doesn't want them in the long term. How can you tell the difference? You have to go and try it out for yourself. And that's how it, that's and then you're back to square one. Okay, so what do you have? What's your first principle here? Well, judge her by the way she treats me. Really? Yeah. Is she acting loyal to you? Absolutely. Three months in, is she finding reasons to kick uh, kick kicked out? No, not really. Well, chances are she picks the kind of guys who don't want to settle down with her. Okay, good. Well, I wouldn't mind it. Good luck, sir. Have fun. You're in uncharted territory. Fill it. Uh, Maybe it's the other case. Maybe after three months, she starts picking fights for random stuff and wanting out, and she doesn't like commitment. She's scared of it. Well, chances are you know that unless you're you're simping for her, unless you're sitting here picturing your, oh, this is what it's going to be like when we're 85 together, and she's already looking at the way out, picking fights for no reason. You have to look with your eyes, not with your heart, right? And again, did the notch count tell you a damn thing? Nope. Nope. And that's assuming you'd even know. Because I don't know if you guys know this. And this is... I don't even know if I should be telling you this. But uh, women often lie about how many men they've slept with. Because they know you judge them for it. I've said it. Don't tell anybody. It's just a secret between us. (laughs) It's a secret between us. They sometimes lie. Really? So how many men, oh, and you go to your girl, like how many men have you been with, honey? Why'd you ask, why would you ask that? A little bit of shame. You're right. Why would I ask that? Or no, no, I just, a guy online asked about it and he's like, he assumed girls would lie. It's like, I'd never lie. I don't know. I had that boyfriend before you, like maybe three or four. That's it. Maybe three or four. Like if there's four, you remember four. So you're like, oh, okay. So you know, it's not that, but she won't fess up because in her mind, she's not, she's not trying to hide the truth from you. She's trying to hide the truth from herself. All right, so that one night stand after the breakup, that didn't count. That wasn't sex. That was me getting over a guy. And this one didn't count for this reason, and this one didn't count, and that, I was like a teenager then, that didn't count. And this one here was just before you, so I mean, that's technically at the same, like that still doesn't, and you see how it works? It's called girl math, girl math. Ads 13, $2.99 Australian. After that impression, heartfelt. I think the only part of the Australian impression I got right was by calling you a right cunt. <laughs> That's the only Australian thing I got right in that whole scenario. I mean, fair. Do women even know the true numbers? Of course they don't know the true numbers. They don't know the true numbers. Nor should they. Like, what is it going to matter? Like I said, you look at the examples. What does it tell you? All it tells you is she's had sex that many times. Or with that many different people. And then everybody, and that's why you get these stupid arguments online, because you're dealing with garbage, garbage information, non-utility, garbage information. And if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So now it's like, well, does it matter if she's had sex a thousand times with one guy or a thousand times a thousand guys? And 
what's the other stupid things? I can't even remember half the things people. Well, it turns out that she co she holds the, the the DNA from five different guys, and you're gonna get some hybrid universal soldier baby if you ever do that. But he won't be loyal to you. And the kid belongs to this. Like, do you see how stupid all of this stuff sounds? It sounds ridiculous. Like, there's a reason. There's a reason. When I run into friends that I haven't seen in a while, they're like, what do you do right now? I'm like, oh, I'm an author. What do you write? Nonfiction. Moving on. I don't talk about this. Do you know why? Because it's fucking embarrassing. You guys have no idea how embarrassing it is when I have to explain anything that I'm doing here with you guys. It's fucking embarrassing. Because my I'm, I've been blessed in that I, I you know, a little bit of pickup in my early 20s because I was struggling with dating. Did it as a hobby, sailed around the world, got my things in there, was surrounded by a lot of guys who absolutely ruthless about uh, beating the woman out of you, you know, beating that feminized brain out of you, which was great, loved it. But the best example I can explain to them is like, so what is it you're doing? You're talking to guys about getting laid? I'm like, basically, I tell them how to be like us. And that's the only thing they understand. Oh, so it's like all the stuff that we did. And then we'll tell some stories about it. Remember that time in San Diego where Jason was mooning the cops over the over some football thing and he got arrested? And we could have helped him, but it was San Diego cops and he got thrown in general population instead because they don't have a drunk tank in San Diego. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember that one. But we were with that, Cana we were with that uh, girl from San Francisco, so we had to go. It's like, yeah. Like trying to get guys to have those kind of experiences. And they, they can understand that. Their wives can't. They're like, you guys did what? <laughs> Actually, in fairness, for the military guys, the wives kind of know. We've been telling our stories for like years. And they were the girlfriend at the time. Hearing us talk about all these exploits. So once we got married, like they remembered. They just don't want to hear it. <laughs> That's why they kind of go, you know what? The girls are just going to go over to the snacking table and, and chew on crackers and cheese. You guys can go over there and talk about them hoes. Talk about those Danish broads in Dubai, because I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> and then every now and then we'll get somebody like, uh, there'll be a, I remember when I was in Montreal, there was a bunch of faculty, like a bunch of teachers, and they were hanging out with us, and we're telling these stories. And the guy looked up to us, and he's like, you know what, I believe about half of what you're telling me. And then my friend who brought him there, she's like, no, these guys have been telling these stories for years. Like, all this stuff basically happened, as he said. In fact, he kind of left out some details. <laughs> So it's kind of good. Um, Latino Cat, are you looking to get on interviews on other channels? Would be cool if you interviewed or were interviewed by Ed Dutton. I put in a request for him to get you on after Red Hawk, followed by you and Rolo. Um, I'm not against it. I'm not against it. My, I, I don't need it for clout. I'm not here like, oh, if I talk with these guys, it'll be big. Joe Rogan will be awesome. Like, I'm, that's not that. I like talking to people I find interesting. And if somebody's interesting, I'll have a chat. I don't like a, he asks me questions, I answer questions. For the most part, it's like, hey, talk about this. In fact, a lot of interview guys kind of get mad because they're like, you're not supposed to ask me questions. I'm like, well, I'm interested. So that's it. As long as he's, as long as he's something interesting. If it's just like one of those, what's that idiot? Uh, who's the idiot who, uh, the gay guy who bought the, bought the baby for him and his boyfriend and they're like the new international dark web or whatever? The fuck is his name? He's the, not Blair White, but the guy, Dave, Dave, some, Dave Rubin, Dave Rubin. Like if it's just one of those guys where it's an empty suit asking questions and the spectacle of the thing, I'm like, no, 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 not a fan of that stuff. I, I, I made that mistake once or twice. The erudite one, absolutely a mistake. Will not happen again. I'm just glad I wasn't that invested. Uh, most of Dutton stuff is streamed on YouTube, but archived elsewhere. Yeah, fair enough. But it's not about what's right for me. I don't even care what's right with me. I just, something interesting. Yeah, and so one more please kind of called it up here. Pretty much you can't fix people who suck. And don't get me wrong. Sucking is not a permanent condition. But you have to not want, you have to want to not suck anymore. You have to not want to suck. And that's the only way it works. That's why you can't market actual information. Like the only guys, the only guys that will ever find this channel are guys that want this. That's it. The guys that want this. Maybe it's out of desperation. Maybe it's out of a desire to learn. Maybe they just thought I was funny on the thing, and they're like, oh, this is kind of neat. I'll never be able to, to pitch it. There's no White Claws here. There's no Drunk Chicks here. Well, I mean, technically, they're Super Chat still, so we got one out of three. That's not so bad, eh? 
I know I promised. I promised no shit talking, but whatever. Uh, demonetized on YouTube, moving to Rumble. Oh, that sucks. I notice a lot of guys get that. And I'm not going to lie. I've, I've never seen anybody demonetized on YouTube and kicked over to Rumble that isn't very clearly pushing the boundaries in a way that there's a sincere risk that you might lose your monetization. I've seen it. I've seen it on Twitter. I've seen it on YouTube. I see it everywhere where a lot of guys just think the rules don't apply to them and they get away with it for a bit. And that's the part that screws you up. It's the same as crack crime. A lot of criminals are stupid because they don't realize like it's marketing. Same as anything else. You know, the hardest part of marketing, it's getting people to learn your fucking name just to learn who is this guy. There's a reason I am an acerbic asshole on Twitter because that is the only way people will understand who the fuck I am. And then hopefully the percentage of them that actually want this information come here. But that's how it works. Same thing with crime. Same thing with crime. Same thing with TOS violations. All that stuff. You'll get away with it for a bit and people will like it because, oh my God, this is against the rules. I love, I love when somebody else takes the risk of going against the rules and it's not me. But I get to sit here and enjoy it like I'm part of the group too. And then you get big. You get famous. You get popular. And then somebody who enforces the rules starts to notice. And they're like, huh. Yeah, take his monetization or in the crime one. Dude, I've seen it all the time. Criminals will be doing stuff. Oh, yeah, you can just do this. Just beat him up and take his crack. And, all right. And then eventually you start doing enough crime that somebody notices. And then when somebody notices, they start paying attention. And because you've had six months of unimpeded crime spree behind you, you're like, why would I change this? What's the risk? I've been doing this all the time. The difference is somebody's looking. Next thing you know, off to jail. I've already told you guys the inbred Blaine story, so I'm not going to tell it again. But you get it. You get it. Now, if we ever see Couch on somebody else's podcast looking for clout, it'll be him showing off all his ads, especially the roll ad. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the thing about getting big as a brand. Either you sanitize or stop growing. Well, it's just about, like, there's tears to this. It's like that uh, layered jello thing, right? I get it. If you want to, you want, if you pass a certain size, you cannot be niche. You have to be more mainstream. And of course you're sanitizing because you're trying to appeal to more people. That's why every house that's made for mass market appeal is painted in that ugly beige color. And here's the problem. Nobody likes beige. Nobody. But nobody hates beige either. And that's why they pick beige. If you ever wonder why the radio that's on at work is horrible music, that's because nobody hates it. Nobody loves listening to Taylor Swift, but nobody hates her either. You're never going to hear the insane, insane clown posse at your office. You're never going to hear like good stuff because some people don't like good things and other people do like good things because to them it's not good and to you it is. For once, I didn't get the reference. <laughs> Took my chainsaw. It's a reference to this guy, Inbred Blaine. I was talking about him last week. Okay, life is easy when you try. It's easier to be better than average when most people suck. Most people make silly mistakes. So many things are simple. We try to make them harder to create drama. That's and that's the problem. I mean, it's not the problem, but that's that's the thing we have to issue. Like I've noticed this, We're doing this for a long time now. Unfortunately, I'd like to say I was proud, but you know, whatever. Just because I'm too stupid to quit doesn't make me doesn't make me any better. <laughs> um, I'm up at 6:51 a.m. in California Saturday because insomnia. Oh, you poor bastard, poor bastard. Okay, so where was I going with this one? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, progressive death metal, insomnia, Candleman, inbred Blaine. Oh, easy into trying, yeah. So for the most part, when we were first discussing things like frame and dread and sexual strategy, it seemed fairly easy. Go to the gym, get attractive, tell your wife to fuck off when she's giving you shit and move on from there, right? But the problem is you tell that to everybody and for the guys that already have their shit together, it works. I'm like, oh, this is great. But then there's the guys that doesn't work. I tried that and now she wants a divorce. And you're like, well, why didn't it work? And this is where you find out that, you know, life is easy when you try. It's a little more complex than that because you're right. If you try, you will be better than average, hands down. But the problem with trying is you sabotage yourself so much. Most of the time, it's some emotional hookups you have. It's some deep-seated insecurities, like all of these little ways that you don't want to succeed because you're so scared of the risk. And it's an irrational fear. This is why when I talk about nice guy behaviors, I bring up failed parenting strategies. Because for a lot of guys, it really is the case that women have been training him 
to seek female validation since he was developing as an infant. And he's never had any male uh, authority figures to show him a more rules-based way of doing it, a more self-internalized like internalized type thing. None of that stuff. This is why Wine More Please always talks about inner game. It's the... And this is like way back when... Uh, what was his name? RSD Tyler or Owen? Which one was the fat one? I think Owen. Maybe Tyler. Tyler. Yes. Was talking about inner game. And that was his big split from Mystery, who was all about outer game and the showmanship and that. And he's like, how about just not being a bitch in your life? Not crying. You know, stuff like that. RSD Owen, thank you. Yeah, and so that stuff was good. Now, that, I mean, he kind of bowled over it. And even now, he's just doing his email marketing, his little seminars. He's making he's making a pretty good bank from it. And he's really good and charming. He's able to charm the pants off the room, which is so weird to look at him. You're like, how is this boring version of Chris Farley any good at it? Apparently he is. I've been talking to people that work with him. They're like, yeah, yeah, he's, he's every bit as charming as you'd expect. And he has to be. Look at him. <laughs> uh, Kyle. Hey, Kyle. Matovic. I always get that wrong. Even when we had our little chat, I got it wrong. Good morning, Ryan. You're welcome for the penny off. Oh, dude, I really do appreciate it. I really do. By the way, thank you for introducing me to, I don't even know what that conversation was where those guys were talking about their, which one of them was more of a bitch, but it was fucking funny. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Yeah, my path was Rich Rollo then Ryan. You did get it right. Okay, good, good. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, it was funny stuff. So yeah, inner game. And that's really what the red pill, at least to me, what it became was like an extension of that concept of inner game to something that was more practical and less internal, you know, external markers. Because just thinking about things and being better about it, that secret stuff, that doesn't really work. Your actions change your thoughts. Your thoughts don't change your actions. And if you don't believe me, ask anybody who's been on TRT and asked how horny they got. I'm like, oh man, started taking testosterone. I've been fucking constantly. You know why? Because we are slaves to our hormones. We're slaves to our actions. You start working out, you start feeling better. I'm so tired. I can't work out. We'll start working out and you'll stop being tired. What if I just assume I'm not tired and think my way through it? It's like, good luck with that, sir. Good luck with that. Uh, my awakening came when Ryan called fresh and fit clowns who don't know what they're talking about. Like, I thought we were on the same side. Yeah. Dude, I love that same side argument. We had that in 20... I was telling guys back in 2018. I remember when we were at that convention that shall not be named. And Tanner Guzzi... It was great guy i'm not talking shit about him he was asking rollo uh why is it like we can't get guys to team up and do this stuff it's like why can't we all get along and i kind of laughed and rollo's like you know men and women are different and i was like well look at it this way for the last year we've been telling guys be your mental point of origin get your act together you know be selfish where necessary you know, only respect the people that have shown value in your life. And now you get all of that internal value there. And you're like, by the way, now play nice and act like a woman. It's like, it's not going to work. Because yeah, I guess if you are training a bunch of people to get some healthy narcissism, it's kind of weird to ask them to start acting like, acting like a collective. Exactly. But I always love that too. And it's, it's kind of a, a display of lower value. And I don't mean it in like the it'll turn girls off on you. I mean it in that it really is. When guys feel the need, especially for this stuff, when they feel the need that they have to have like a herd for safety, no, we all got to get along, unified front, blah, blah, blah. When you're doing this over like an abstract concept, like you know, masculinity or whatever branding topic you want to do, it's like, bro, what are you doing? Well, it doesn't work if only one of us is masculine and has his shit together. It's like, I'm pretty sure your life will work great. If you're the only guy in your life who has his shit together, <laughs> call it a hunch. You, you, I have no research. I have no cited sources. I don't have a blue haired guy cheerleading it for me, but I'm pretty sure if you have your shit together, you don't need a rat pack. Call it a hunch. Yeah. I love how everybody in the manosphere is my bro apps and do I'm why more please taught me this and I've learned it. And my shitty childhood taught me this. It's like most of the people that are your peers, especially here, they're not your bros. Do you think people who have their shit together come to the, to the red pill, to the manosphere? Like, no, they don't. Do you know who comes here? Rejects. Nobody who's happy. It's like, you know what? Life is going great. My wedding is perfect. My wife just had her third kid. 
and I just made my first million dollars. I'm going to go watch a podcast where they start yelling at hoes in Miami and kicking them off. <laughs> that's that's the piece that's missing. That's the one piece of my life that's like, no, it's the guy who's like, dude, I've jerked off so much that I'm missing skin on my hand. My ex has done a restraining order. I don't know what girls smell like anymore. They don't even shower every day, and I'm in my sad MGTOW apartment. I'm going to feel a little better about myself because at least I'm not a whore like her. That's who's watching that shit. That's your brothers. Why would you have anything but disdain for them? Why would you want to piss on them if they were on fire? My brother, my brother in Christ. They are not your brothers. They am not my brother's creeper. Oh, look at this. Background playing scum. You're still on scum, eh? It's not bad, green light. I'm not going to lie. Like, if there's more people on it, it would probably be better. Because it kind of reminds me of like an empty Rust server. The ones, at least the one we did it here. Uh, the guys who come here after a divorce as part of a midlife crisis are probably the most normal. Oh, they're the most potential. They're the ones I like to focus on. Uh, and big subs. Actually, here's an important one. So, hey, Ryan, love the Praxeology Volume 1 book. Any plans for another? Funny you mentioned that. Yes, there's plans for another. So, technically, technically, Praxeology was supposed to be one book. Just Praxeology. That was it. It was supposed to be an all-encompassing, everything from the Red Pill and the Married Red Pill condensed into a single thing and the problem came once i was writing it and i got through the first draft and i'm like all right so it's like 100,000 words 110,000 120,000 i'm like this is too big for a book so i split it up and i'm like how, where was a good demarcation line and then i found out there was two big concepts that kind of got a lot of play and everything kind of fit into one or the other and that was frame and that was dread which is funny because if you think about rule zero positive male identity and sexual strategy what do you think that is? Positive male identity is absolutely frame. And sexual strategy is absolutely dread. So it, it is natural for there to be two points. So I had to split it up into two books. And Praxeology Volume 1 Frame was the first book. And then the second book is going to be on dread. Or uh, how to train yourself to not be taken for granted in a sexual relationship. Now, I've... Uh, also, like part of my marketing has always been have an email list, right? That was the one thing they drilled into your head when you first start, you know, grifter school. Have an email list, grow that list. It's agnostic, like it's agnostic no matter what happens. They can ban you from everything. As long as you have that email list, you have an audience. So like always keep that. And so I had it. And, you know, email lists can get kind of expensive. For a while there, it was like $200 a month just to send these emails off. And most people just like write, like I remember AJ Cortez, I was, I was logged to a couple guys and his was like, I had a bagel today and I realized carbs are bad. And it was like the most basic, it was like reading TikTok. It was that bad. And so I'm like, God, I don't want to do this. So what did I do? And I'm like, well, I'm writing a book. Why don't I just give you guys parts of the book for free as I'm writing it? You know, like, hey, just so you know, this is not the finished copy of it, but hey, you can see what's coming out in it. You can see all the material. And everybody seemed to like it and it got to a decent size. But then I'm like, uh, Ali suggested Substack to me. And this is where I'm getting with this. So if you want to see where book three is and how it's getting along, join the Substack. I'll have a link in here somewhere. I'll pin it to the chat, something like that. So, And that was good. So now I was like, oh, that's perfect. So instead of paying 200 a month for like MailChimp or whatever to send my email lists, I can just use Substack and they do that same service for free as well as like a subscriber mode blog platform. I'm like, perfect. And so I, so for every week, I make sure I put like three, four, 5,000 words worth of book excerpts in there, make about 2,000 of them for free, and then 2,000 of them under the paywall. So yeah. So if you, if you want to, just join the sub stack. Actually here, I'll type it in now. We're gonna lean right in. Let me pull it up, put it in there. Like I said, it's there's a subscriber model, but it's not required. It's up to you. Yeah, there. And because they added this stupid heart to YouTube. Does anybody else get this? The problem is if I need to click the three dots next to a text thing, the heart always gets in the way of like the newest message. So annoying. All right, let me see. Uh, yeah, so that's the plans for the second book. Right now, I'm on the second draft of it. The first draft is done. Unfortunately, it's it it ballooned up again, so it's still at like 100,000. So this second draft, I'm trying to cut it down. I need it down to about 75, 80,000 words at most. 
60 to 70 is usually a good zone because you don't want a book that's so big that people can't remember the beginning of it when they get to the end. So that's the plan there. We'll see how I'm doing it. Uh, so also, okay, here we go. So from Jimmy, also people who have their life together tend to be more low key and far away from stuff in the internet. Not necessarily. They're living life to their fullest and enjoying it like Carl is. But there's also a small subset of guys is like, I have nowhere else to brag about this stuff. Like, I remember this cat. He was cheating on his wife because, you know, and there's a whole long story to that. I won't get into the morality of it, but he's like, I can't brag anywhere else but amongst you stupid losers here to give you an idea of what possibly could happen if you get your shit together. So it's funny. There's a lot of guys who do stick here who do have their shit together, but you can usually, but they're usually very, like, they're not stupid. They know most people here are tards. And so they're very selective about who they engage with. So it's one of those funny things. Uh, thanks for the explanation. Awesome book. I'd recommend it to all men who want to improve. Looking forward to it. Oh, dude, like I said, if, if you're willing to read it, I'm willing to write it. Uh, AK499 Super Chat. Thank you very much, sir. I watch for the shit talking. You're the king. <laughs> I got here late. Did Trudeau finally admit the reason for his divorce is because he's a bundle of <laughs> Maybe Maybe the reason for that. Actually, you know what? If I have a theory, I have a theory, and I remember there was an old short fat otaku video, The Problem with Trudeau, and it came out in like 20, 2015 when he first got elected, I think, somewhere around there anyway. And there was this scene at a, at a fundraiser for the Liberal Party, and he was sitting there talking with his wife, and they caught like a conversation, like the camera was picking it up. Where he was talking about himself like he was fucking Neo from the Matrix. Like, yeah, I'm the savior of Canada. And and she kind of like did up his jack. She's like, honey, be humble. <laughs> and I have a feeling he's just a, like a giant raging narcissist. And his wife, which, and she's a Quebec chick. So she's no emotional stalwart herself. But I have a feeling she could only handle him talking about how fucking awesome he was for so long. And then he's like, and I'm pretty sure he was sleeping with the foreign affairs minister. So, yeah. Um, I agree with Rolo having Monty Python style British humor is peak alpha behavior. You know what he means though by that? He means that I don't cater to the lowest common denominator when I make jokes. I cater to somebody who has to like pay attention to be into it. It's not because I'm smarter or anything like that. It's just because it's the style of humor I enjoy. Like my favorite jokes are when they're at somebody's expense, but that person doesn't know it, but everybody else does. And I find that to be absolutely hilarious. Do you ever hear that one where they say diplomacy is the ability to tell someone to go to hell and have them look forward to the trip? I think that's not diplomacy. That's fucking humor. I love it. Satire is great too, because if you can make a satirical take on something and people take it literally, oh, it makes it wonderful. It's so wonderful. Ryan, define a nig. It's teasing. A nig is teasing. That's it. Uh, Ryan doesn't care about LGMs. He wants to swap notes without spurging. Yeah. I got to do as little as I have to for spurging. Should Patreon guys move to Substack? No, no, no. Patreon and Substack are totally different things, and they do different things. The Patreon is for field reports. It's for, it's like a crash course, a 101, as close as I can get you to like a university level syllabus of red pill. You know, get guys to define what they're trying to achieve get guys to articulate that to themselves, get them to learn to write field reports to perform what I call an OODA loop. That's observe, orient, decide, act. The idea with that is that if you're able to, and a lot of guys like really suck at being able to do this, like they get steps wrong, they linger on stop. So you get them to get into that process and the faster they're able to conduct those loops, the faster they're able to fix their problems. And so that's what that place is for. That's for that. The guys are working on it, fixing their marriages, marriage, divorce, single. It doesn't really matter. Frame doesn't care about your relationship status, right? Stubstack is more of, it's like a comedy hour. You get to see me writing the material before the book comes out with all of the polish and stuff like that. So you get to be behind the scenes. You get to read and catch up on this stuff. A lot of guys love that. Like if you've ever watched DVD commentary on the movies you liked or behind the scenes stuff, that's what the Substack is. Did you use all the big words? I tried. I tried to use all the big words. There's something about a big vocabulary that just makes you sound super smart and stuff. It's like, wow, this man can read a thesaurus. Uh, suck his dick. <laughs> yeah. I uh, use landscape to get rid of the heart. How am I going to use landscape on my goddamn desktop, you dope? <laughs> 
Anyways, uh, from what I understand, Ryan, Chest, and Winemore were a trio back on Reddit fighting for freedom in the red pill space. No, 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 no. We were laughing at retards. That was all we did. Winemore didn't even, he didn't even have the pretense of, I'm not here to help guys. He's like, I'm here to laugh at you losers. I'm here to laugh and watch you fail, and that's it. And even Chesty was the same way. Do you have a midweek show, dude? I mean, there's mids watches. Right now on this channel, I uh, I only have like really the two shows. There's this and there's mids watches. And they, I try to bring them out midnight on Thursday, but I had to record some new footage. So in the middle of the week here, I have a, a whole live recording where I recorded like three or four of them. Some guys actually like seeing the recording sessions. So that's it. But uh, definitely make a goddamn hardcover. I know. Make a hardcover. I remember. But yeah, and Zach's got it right. So most of my other stuff then during the week is on Digital Ryan. That's the gaming channel. It's it's for my eventual pivot out of the fucking red pill space. And it's going to be like Minecraft and Project Zomboid. And then we play Diablo together. It's just, And a nice group of guys. We call them the T-Rex army. And that's a joke about the nofap guys. But there's like a whole lore behind it. A whole iceberg. It's pretty fun. Yeah, but all... And I, yeah, Marty's right. I got a lot of promises of stuff that I'm going to go back to doing once book three is done. Because until then, it's just... I'm just spread too thin. So I, I can only do so much in a day. As much as you think. Like, what do these guys do all day? It's like, well, I'm busy as fuck. Writing a book. Doing a podcast. Doing my shows. Making scripted gaming videos. Two or three streams a week. Plus, like, a collab with the guys on every Friday. And, like, it all kind of weighs down on you. Plus, I'm trying to read uh, books and do some studying for my own skill sets, too, so... Yeah, well, it's not been three times a week lately, but we'll get there. So, yeah, it's, it's, I'm a busy bee. And then on top of that, you know, when I'm on the toilet, tweet some acrimonious stuff to piss off retards. But enough about me. I've been talking here about me and the business for a long time. I, I wanted to get back to the story time. I love the story time. If you've noticed, I haven't done any ads. I don't know, I just didn't feel it. Like, uh, maybe the book one. I've transformed. I'm charming. I'm good looking and in shape, but bored. I need something to do next. Another challenge to conquer. Please give it to me. Yeah. Hard to believe I gave up a six figure salary. Dude, I hate traffic. I fucking hate traffic. I hate traffic, and I hate when I don't have something to show for my work. And then there's something they don't tell you about information security and compliance and all that stuff when you're doing the, the back end stuff is always subservient to front office, which makes sense. They're the ones bringing in revenue, right? But at the same time, it really sucks when you realize your whole reason there is to try to make changes to make the thing more secure and nobody wants them done until something goes wrong. And then it's, why wasn't this stuff done? And that's so your job basically becomes CYA. My job is to tell you guys all the things you're supposed to do so that when you screw them up, it doesn't happen and the problems happen that I said would happen that you can't blame me because I tried to tell you about this six months ago. And I'm like, that's not not worth it. And I just realized, like, what am I doing with this? Six figures, bringing home, like, you know, 10,000 to paycheck kind of thing. And I was just like, all I did with it is I would just buy goofy stuff to make myself feel better about earning that much money. And I'm like, fuck it. I don't really need toys that bad. Yeah, so I left InfoSec for network engineering. Oh, yeah, so you get it too. Yeah. That's cybersecurity in a nutshell, isn't it, though? There was always my joke. I was bugging, not my last C CIO, but the one before that, my, my first post-military CIO. And I was like, so your job here is basically as the sacrificial lamb if, you, if we get a giant data breach, isn't it? He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, because like every one of our changes gets shot down by, by C-suite, right? He goes, yeah. So like if we run into problems... Your job is to basically say, well, we've let him go on that. He goes, yeah, so I guess that's why I get paid the big bucks. And then he showed me a photo of his brother who was a cop in Ireland beating the shit out of some protesters, and we had a good laugh over that one. Yeah, green light's right. The less you need, the more you have. And that's something I noticed here, too. And I thought this would be like a giant hit. This is something, as here's one of those follow your dreams, fellas, but do it smart. So everybody thinks you just, I eh, just left your job to go online and that's it, right? Like, no, I actually had prepared. So from the military, when I was leaving the military to go work corporate, I was terrified. I'm like, how hard is it going to be to find a job? I haven't had to look for one in 13 years. So I saved up and I sacrificed. I did the beans and rice thing. So I had a two year nest egg. That means mortgage payments, bills, food for two years. 
I had that save sitting there in a savings account, my war chest. No matter what happens, the girl can leave me, fine. I got my war chest. The economy can tank, that's fine. I got two years. I can have to wait a whole year because all the jobs I can find are shit. Fine, I got a two-year war chest. And then I was like, you know what? Okay, so I'm going to spend like a year on a sabbatical, and then I'll start. And that lasted about three months. And I was beside myself with boredom. So I started, I'm like, all right, I'm getting back into it. And it was actually pretty quick. Moved to Toronto, and I was like, geez. And then my war chest was only six months out. So I'm like, all right, I'll refill it back up. I was earning way better money than I thought I would. And so I had this two-year war chest always sitting there. And it turns out, if you don't do that, start. The, the mental stress that you remove from your life just by having the knowledge that for two years, I can just sit on my ass and do nothing and I'll be fine. To be able to sit there to yourself and believe that, nothing faces you anymore. Your boss is pissing you off. You're like, you'll end up with this look like, is this enough? Mm. But they, but, and then here's the funny part is they don't fuck with you. People don't fuck with you when you don't present as being fucked with. And I'm not saying this is a tough guy thing. It was just, yeah, everything just got easier. Maybe I, maybe it was just affecting me less because I didn't have the stress of, oh, I need to keep this job. And then, so I had it and I was probably, I don't know, it's probably five years into the corporate stuff. And I was like, oh, you know what? Like my, even my girl's like, dude, you're drinking a lot. You're just buying, like you bought this camera, you're buying this, you're buying that. I'm like, yeah, and I'm going to try something out. And then I got laid off. And so I'm like, well, do I want to get back into it? And you're like, you know what, hon? I'm going to try being an author and I'm going to do a YouTube thing. I'm going to start doing this conference stuff. And she looked at my Twitter and she's like, oh, you got 10,000 followers. All right, good luck. So like there was all this prep and it sounds like, oh, he just said, fuck you, walked out of his job, but then became an influence. We're like, no, no, no. There was a lot of prep behind it. And nobody pays attention to that stuff. Rich is absolutely right. Rich Cooper, when he says nobody cares about your, your, your path, they just want to see, fuck you at the finish line or whatever. Absolutely true. Nobody cared about any of that stuff except for me, but it was there when I needed it. And then I would hear my friends talk about it. It's like, yeah, it's crazy that you just took the risk. You just left the military and then did your thing. And then you just left this to write a book. And they're acting like it was the most flippant decision. I'm like, okay, yeah. Even my one buddy, he did the same thing I did. Once I got out, he got the confidence to get out. Even his wife even thanked me for it. And she goes, and he goes, yeah, I remember this. Like for a bunch of those weekends, we used to go to the bar every night and you never joined us. And I was so pissed at you. Cause you were busy getting your fucking degree. And then after that you started working. And then once I left, he goes, I get it. I kind of wish I had taken that time and done it too. And maybe he got his master's and he's working crazy income right now, crushing me. So it's, it's always good to see. Yeah. Hint. I'm always open to a severance package. Oh, don't get me wrong. The severance package was a nice buffer. And that's why the war chest kept not depleting. Cause like every time I'd left one of these things, there'd be like a fairly decent severance package. The military gave me a severance package. Corporate stuff gave me a severance package, so I couldn't even use the war chest if I wanted to. I have digital Ryan streams in the background while working in Excel. Oh, gee, dear God. So Marty's telling you about Febreze, boy? Jesus. Hey, what's up, Nuke here? What's up, Nuke? Nuke Cadillo? Yeah, turn those two years into three years in that war chest. Well, I mean, it's just, at this point, if there's more than two years in the war chest, I just invest it. Because it's money I'm not going to use. And I don't want to just have it sitting in a savings account. I don't need it immediately. Which I guess, I mean, altogether, I guess this is kind of my red-pilled story. Because I never got red-pilled by a woman. I was pretty, eyes were pretty much open to sexual dynamics. When I had read Rolo's thing about, you know, saving the best this and doing this, I had seen most of that stuff. If not in my own life, through a lot of my coworkers and family members. Yeah. Oh, yeah, don't get me wrong. Zero debt's freeing, too. So yeah, for me, it was mostly the military. You know, everybody's like, yeah, you got to you gotta belong to a tribe and you got to, what's the, oh, fuck, I even suck at the talkie points. You got to belong to a tribe. You got to be the masculine. You got to save the West. It's like, dude, I was there, been there, done that. I got some baseball caps for my troubles and a little shadow box. Having that dream crushed was like, that was my zeroing out. And that's why I laugh when everybody's like, where's the, we need to do, like, you don't need to do shit. Go try it. You'll get fucked over. I guarantee it because some opportunist will see you for the mark that you are. Ask me how I know. And the worst part is the better you are at your job, the easier of a mark you are. It would almost be better. And that's why you see like a bunch of thud fuck coworkers doing better than you or as good as you or whatever. 
because they're not the mark. So nobody's like using them for their own gain. They're just left alone. And that's when you realize, oh my God, they're taking advantage of you to the point that you have devolved into like that piece of shit coworker that nobody wants to work with. That's what they're taking from you. How do you not get a little angry from that? How do you not get a little selfish? How do you not get jaded from that? That's something I'd like to know. And the only answer I have is because they've never been there. They probably are that piece of shit guy. And they like those hard workers because they make me look good. Because they cover my shift when I'm hungover. Yeah. Coworkers keep asking, what the hell is wrong with this Marty guy and this Febreze boy? Oh, if only they knew the half of it. Reminded me I need to build a war chest. Yes, absolutely. Dude, I'm telling you. If I do the next cooking video, it's going to be beans and rice. I'll call it the war chest, the war chest cooking fund. Beans, rice, corn. Turn that into a burrito with some uh, ground beef. Freeze, freeze a hundred of them. Put them a hundred of them in the freezer. Individually separated because you don't want a giant burrito ice cube. And you can live off of that for forever. And you could, it's amazing. If you really had to cut down to bare minimum to save yourself a chest, what you can do with how little. You didn't save the West as part of the Canadian military? Dude, I tried. I seriously tried. And I was fucking good at it, too. Actually, you know what? Here, we're, we're telling stories. Here is a story about why I think saving the West is ridiculous. There's two stories. First one, well, actually, the first one's about saving the West. The second one is about distrusting the journalism. The saving the West one. So we were deployed with the 7th Fleet. We had to go underneath through the Panama Canal, up north through the Suez Canal, and then in the Horn of Africa. So we're going between the Horn of Africa and the Straits of Hormuz. That's all the way up to like Dubai and down south to like uh, South Africa. Pirate hunting. And every Canadian was desperate because like uh, a ship a couple years back found like 40 million dollars worth of cocaine and dumped into the ocean. It was like great for parties and stories and whatever. So we were out there. Now here's the problem. Command thought, this is great. We're in charge of the Seventh Fleet, blah, 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 blah. This didn't think about, okay, so what time of year is it? Well, it's cyclone season. So Dows aren't out there trafficking drugs. You know why? Because they'll crash in Sea State 4 waves on the Indian Ocean. Well, that sucks. But, but the heroin's coming through in Afghanistan, right? Well, it's poppy growing season. There's no heroin yet. All right, all right. Well, at least there's, there's, other, there's other stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're out there, and it was crazy because every time a news crew came on board, we somehow managed to have, oh, the radar just pull up a suspected pirate and drug smuggler. It was crazy the amount of timing, the perfection we had in the timing. So all this stuff was happening, and the one time, the one time we got a mayday on the radio, that's like an emergency, like help, help, help. Now, international maritime law, if you respond to a pan-pan or a mayday, you are obliged, you are obliged to render assistance. International rules, right? So our captain was all excited. It's like, finally, some fucking action. There was a cruise ship that was getting chased by pirates. And they're like, help, help. We're fishtailing, trying to keep them off of us, using the fire hoses to keep them off, that kind of stuff. And he's like, take that call. And the XO's like, sir, <laughs> captain, sir. It's like, just take the call. God damn it. Quit questioning me. So he takes the call. And like, where's, give us your condition, your coordinates. And so he gives the coordinates and the officer of the day or officer of the watch charts it out. And then you see the, the fucking bravado just flush from the captain's face. And it's like, what's up? They're 300 miles away. <laughs> it's like, oh no, this is funny because, uh, the, the frigate class ships in the Canadian military, they do 25 knots on diesel generators, diesel engines, and they have gas turbines that can pump it up to about 35. So we do 35 nautical miles an hour. They are 300 miles away, actively being chased by pirates. Do the math there. Why do you think that was a mistake to take that mayday call? So burning fuel by the cubic meter, we're barreling towards this thing. Like it's at the point that all of a sudden racks, people start falling out of their racks. It was like Keystone Cops funniness. We have a chopper on board, a Sea King. And they're like, all right, so they're trying to do the, the fuel math with the, uh, with the pilot. Like, we, we need to give it as little fuel as possible because fuel is weight. And so you can't go fast with too much fuel. But at the same time, they're like, okay, so they strip it. They take out all the ammo. They take out all the weapons. They take out everything. All that's left in there is the shell. And I think somebody brought a, a C8, which is like a, an M249. So basically like a belt-fed gun. That's it. 
and they're going out there as fast as they can ahead of us. Now, the reason now, like as a ship, you're like, well, it's fine. They're going to be fast. Now you guys can slow down. No, because the amount of fuel they had, they had enough fuel to get there and then get about halfway back. <laughs> so we had to hurry up to get to that rendezvous point or the choppers going in the going in the washer, going in the water. And that's like a $10 million oopsie. All because you answered the radio, right? And it was the funniest thing. So they managed to get there. By the time they got there, the ship had already like scuttled them off and they left or whatever. And so they had come back and I'm serious. They were like coasting. Like you ever see like a paper airplane when it does that little like this just before it lands. That was like the chopper. And we managed to pick it up in the bear claw just before then. And it was like the, the funniest thing. And then that same week, our tanker had found a, a ship that would run. Uh, something happened. They ran out of fuel. The engine broke, something like that. And they were towing them in to, I think it was Djibouti. Yeah, Djibouti was the one. French colony. And our command ship, the Iroquois, just outside the horizon, gave orders. The Commodore ordered that you guys will cease towing activities. And so the, the tanker took it off and let it off. Then the command ship came and started towing it in the rest of the way. So they got all the glory. They got in the news and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, so this is what saving the West is like, right? A bunch of people fighting for who gets the best cocktail party story, looking for honor and valor in a world with none and costing dude people almost died we almost killed our own people we caused so much misery because everybody wanted to save the west it was fucking ridiculous now here's the thing that makes me laugh the most this is the second side of it with like uh reporting so we had cnn on board for that for that incident with the uh with the the scuttling of the ship and all that stuff right and so they saw everything. They saw, oh, we picked up these pirates, and it was just some fishermen that we just fucked around with and dropped their nets and did whatever. And then later on, somebody's like, hey, we made the news. And I was like, cool, we'll look it up. And it's like a Canadian warship. And the way they told the story, they told it like we were like in a World War II uh, recruitment poster. Three sailors, you know, stripped down naked, dived into the water, put some knife in their teeth, and started stabbing terrorists and saved the day. It's like that... Dude, I want to be on this deployment that they wrote about. Where the fuck are we? <laughs> and then I realized, it's like, oh my God. So like, I was there. I saw the event. And then I saw the reporting on it. And the reporting on it made us look like fucking heroes. When in reality, it was like Keystone Cops. And I have never trusted the media since then. And it's, even to YouTubers. Like, dude, I love guys like uh, Short Fat Otaku. Or uh, who's the other one? I should the think before you sleep. I was even kind of like, oh, okay, I kind of get into his content, but it's the funny thing. So I, as principal, I, uh, Short Fat Otaku did an episode on Jack Murphy and I'm like, not watching it. I was like, why? Isn't that that guy? I'm like, yeah, but I guarantee you if I watch it, I'm going to realize he's mostly full of shit on his videos and I don't want to do that to him. So I watched it on the other one though. And I watched his video on, it was something else that I knew about. And then I watched it. I'm like, oh my God, like these guys got 80% of the details wrong. And the ones that they got right were really, really, like, not true. And I just realized, like, everybody's a bullshit artist. Nobody knows what the fuck they're doing about. And, like, maybe I'm doing, like, is there something that I'm describing that's absolute bullshit? And I'm like, well, probably. I don't think I'm any better than CNN. Well, I mean, I am, but you know, you know what I mean. And that's, and that's kind of, it's helped me, too, where I realize when I talk to you guys and you guys talk about red pill truths and that, I'm like, there's no truth. Forget truth. You're never going to get truth. I'm going to bullshit you either on purpose or accidentally. Other people are going to bullshit you on purpose or accidentally. Ignore the idea of getting a factual, truthful anything about this. In fact, what you should be looking for is, does this information help me? Is it useful? And I think that's, that's, that's all you can really hope for. Are all women really like that? Probably not. But if you assume all women are like that, do you tend to have better outcomes? Yeah, well, all women are like that. I used to have a meme for the longest time. Where guys would say, <laughs> they thank Ryan, I see your super chat. Where I used to say, if I could tell guys the moon was made out of cheese. And that would get them to go to the gym three days a week, lose a bunch of weight, look attractive. Then as far as the red pill is concerned, the moon is made out of cheese. But the moon's not made out of cheese. I don't care if it's made out of cheese. It got you to the gym, didn't it? So as far as you're concerned, the moon's made out of cheese. Everybody fucking lies to you anyway. The news lies to you. Girls are lying to you parents lie to you the church lies to you everybody's lying to you at least this way you're lying to yourself for your own best interests 
How many people can say that? If everybody's going to lie to you anyway, at least this guy's lying in a way that makes my life better. I can live with that. I can deal with that. It's technically a, ma a female sexual strategy adopted to male sensibilities, which a lot of the red pill is. Fun fact. That's the, the current thing. There's always this deception and detection arms race between men and women. Because women want to have the genes of the guy that they want, but they want to have provision. The dual male, male or dual sexual mating strategy stuff. You know that, right? So how does that play out? Oh, yeah, it's your baby. It turns out there's a 1 in 50 chance that you can have a dark-skinned baby with curly hair, Stephen. Oh, okay. I guess that's mine. Kids all have curly hair. But the problem is when girls are lying, and when everybody's lying, you can kind of tell. There's tells about it. Because it's hard. To, it actually is a, it's, it's taxing for somebody to hold a lie in. You have to keep a second narrative in place in your head. You have to be consistent. It's hard to do, and over a long enough timeline, everybody gets caught. So the sexual strategy that women have adopted is they lie to themselves. And that's why when you're like, remember before we were talking about notch counts and the girl was like, do they even know their own notch counts? I'm like, no, no, they don't. They have to lie to themselves about this stuff, not counting, and they have to believe it. So when they tell you, they aren't telling, there's no lies detected, no tells, no nothing. And that's why you're not supposed to trust what people say. You're supposed to watch what they do. Because with actions, you cannot lie. Actions are truthful. Because actions have consequences. Come on. There we go. Actions have consequences. So just watch what people do. Uh, Ryan Chung gave me 75 NT dollars, which I don't know which ones those are, but they, they look good. Some non-communist money to make your Hong Kong non-commie in the other channel. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that's the other one, SimCity. I've been playing SimCity 4, which I haven't touched since I was deployed back in like 2008. So it's nice to get back into that. Um, no, I never did go to Morocco. I've been to, I mean, outside of the U.S., which I've done both the coasts and the northern border. Uh, Mexico, Panama, Gibraltar, Spain, Italy, Greece. South Korea, Dubai. Did I already say Croatia? Um, I did South Korea, Thailand, the Philippines, but that doesn't really count. Japan. Didn't do Alaska. I'm probably missing some countries, but yeah, altogether I've been to about two dozen countries over the years, either travel or not. Oh, Ireland, uh, the Republic of, not the British one. The UK. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, a cruise ship chased by pirates. Yeah, welcome to the club, man. Ten hours to fuck up and do fuck all. Exactly. Uh, why not send the chopper? Laughs in Nimitz class. Yeah, I guess being on the carrier, it's a little bit different. We had one helicopter pad and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have jets or inter... But what good's an interceptor going to do against a fast patrol boat? An FPB with an AK. Send the F-15s after them. The F-16s. Must have been such a fun... I will tell you this, though. It actually was kind of a fun 10 hours. Because the amount of, like, we're going to war, better get fucking moving, like, all hands on deck, everything got redlined immediately. So it was fun. It was really stupid. But the fact that everybody was so good at their job and so competent and so excited finally to have something to do for action, it actually was like I, I, I goof around talking about it being a shitty experience, but it was a good experience. It was just very shitty from a command perspective. Yeah, uh, but couch engaging narrative sells better than boring truth. Yeah, of course it does. Uh, it's over selling just like on LinkedIn. If you see people lie and stretch stuff, look like corporate LinkedIn culture, a bunch of people worship each other, praise the mundane stuff. When are you and Rolo coming to the UK? Would like you to sign the Praxeology book. Would be great. It's on the list. Uh, to be fair, I've got to get down to, where is he now? Vegas or Nevada or whatever. I got to get down there one of these days. I have promised him a visit. We were supposed to go to like Cape Corral or Carnarvon or I, I don't know America very well. But like one of those Florida places that's fun to party with and go fishing. It's, it's been on the list, but I'm just like refusing to fly right now because COVID is just, Canada was already on the cusp of like, yeah, I, I'll take a flight. I'll go fly here. I'll go fly there. And I hate it. But now it's at the point that post COVID, they fucked up so much that I'm like, it's like a humiliation ritual. You're like, you know what? I don't need to travel that bad right now. I'd rather dry. Carl Gables, Florida. Maybe. I don't know. 
I don't know. But yeah, if I if I end up getting there, absolutely come by. I'll probably bring a couple of copies with me if somebody wants to sign one too when I go to these places. I'll, I'll make the effort to remember, unless it's a personal trip. I got to head down to the West Coast near the end of the year. One of my buddies is retiring, and so I'm going to fly down and surprise him. It'll be pretty fun. Uh, what are we on for time here? I guess, so I'm not talking any shit to other people, so we'll do another book one. Charles Bukowski. Jordan Peterson. Neil Strauss. I like these guys. Add some salt to cover up the bitterness of middle-aged soccer moms and put in the oven for 45 minutes. Optionally, you can take from all this stuff what you want and leave the rest. So enjoy Fuck Files. 15 lessons from a decade of women, now on audio. Man, so I used to have the game back in 2007. And it was like the old version. The old version actually had like a plastic cover that, was, that felt like leather, so it looked like a Bible had the ribbon and all that. Lent it to a buddy. Because he wanted to see about this pickup stuff, never gave it back. I was actually very pissed off about that. He's married now. He's got two kids. But I'm pretty sure he lost the book. Like, you son of a bitch. Yeah, too bad the train isn't a viable tournament to a flight like in Europe. I mean, it is. It just takes so fucking long. Like, if I wanted to go to BC, for example, it's like a five-day train ride. As opposed to, like, a five-hour flight. Uh, Does the game provide anything that the mystery method doesn't? No, the game is not... A, a manual the game is the story of neil strauss in the pickup community they don't really talk much about how to run routines in that it's closer to it's closer to fuck files minus the lessons like the first half of each chapter of fuck files that was the problem i had with it i'm like it's a great story but there's nothing substantive in it and that's why i have like bukowski's women uh jordan peterson's 12 rules for life and neil strauss is the game because those books i did like all of those books except for peterson's i kind of skimmed it and like it's all just random platitudes. I'm like, I would really prefer if this book had substantive advice and not just, eh, if you see a cat, leave it the fuck alone. You know, stuff like that. Clean your room. It's like very mundane. I'd love it if there was some really like raw, hard hitting stuff in there. And that's why that book was written that way. Bukowski's Women was great, but it's kind of his way of like shirking a positive male identity. And I was like, man, like it's good. I like that he's doing his own thing and doing it his way. But it was just so self-destructive. It'd be nice to see a way for a positive male identity as opposed to a negative one. And then the third one was the game. I'd love the expose and the storytelling is nice. I just hate how there's nothing in there other than gossip. And so, like to amalgamate those three, that's why I wrote fuck files the way I did. So yeah. Uh, your book is better than all of those. I hope so. I mean, it doesn't sell as good as any of them. But I mean, you know, one day, one day. If I'm if I'm as big as Hillary Clinton, I can sell a Hillary Clinton type book copy. Uh, does the game okay? Uh, could you do a Red Morning with the T Rex guys, similar to how you did the Rule Zero last week? The show was kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could. I mean, if, I guess a few guys are even here. It's just a matter of setting it up. That's the problem is that everybody's like, because Jack's in Europe and Misha's in Saudi Arabia, and I guess Dave is on the West Coast, but I think he works on Saturdays, so. It's mostly just about getting them together, but it, I'll, it'll it'll be on the list, the to-do list. Yeah, maybe bring green light out of retirement. You can take. Do you think you could take some time out of your busy day smoking meat to come and talk to guys about being a man? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Bish is absolutely right. The mystery DVD course. Yes. Oh, dude, it's um. I think they called it Armageddon, the Armageddon method. Hold on a sec. This was act. Oh, dude, we're gonna. Oh. Dude, I guess. I think it's this one. Yeah. So I think it's called the Armageddon course, the DVD. It was Neil Strauss actually ran it. You'll recognize it because he has, it was like this weird phase in the early to mid 2000s where you would wear a t-shirt over top of a dress shirt. I can't explain it. It's, it is what it is. But it was Neil Strauss with like a pinstriped shirt and a pink t-shirt on top of it. Running guys through the concept of game and mystery showed up for a couple of uh, things there too. It was, it was my introduction to pick up back in the day. And I was like, this looks like fun. And it was like gamified, gamified flirting. I'm like, I can get with that. But yeah, if you can find it, it's definitely fun. It's definitely worth it. I don't know. I haven't watched it since like 2006, 2007. So I don't know if it was, if it still holds up, but I'm pretty sure it does. I don't think it's needs certain technology. 
Uh, time tabers, a young guy moving to county university, want to start practicing game. Where can I start my reading? Yeah, honestly, that's how I started. I just picked up the mystery DVD and then ran a routine and tried it out and had fun with it. It doesn't really matter. There's Day Game or Day Bang by Roosh. There's the London Day Game model. There's the mystery DVDs. There's the M3 book. Any one of them. It's all training wheels. And that's something you'll kind of figure out as you go. It's just it's a fun game you can play to make dating more fun and give a structure to it so that way you like know where your weak spots are. But once you get good at it, it's like then you just take the training wheels off and you just like I don't need any of it anymore. You just kind of point your bike in the direction you want to go and ride. You don't have to nig anymore because if you're bored, you start teasing the girl and it's fun. You don't have to escalate. You just you I guess it's like an internalization of the concepts. It's really it's really, you end up being that guy that just draws the fucking owl. If you don't get that reference, that's an old pickup one where people say, this is why dating advice sucks. Because people say, just draw the, like, how do you draw an owl? Well, put some circles on the page, then just draw the rest of the fucking owl. It's like, that's not helpful advice. And so a lot of these things were just made to fill in the blanks, like how to draw the owl and that. So, yeah. Let's see your signed copy of the mystery method. You know what? I probably should. Because mystery, apparently mystery lives in Toronto. I could drive over to his fucking house. I got to find out. Maybe I do get a hold of him. But if I did that, I'd probably want to have a, like an interview and a chit chat with him. I don't even know. Would he even be into that? I know he's been kind of like off the grid. Like he doesn't want to get involved in any of this nonsense, but that would be fun. You know, that's going to be like a long-term goal of me just to track down mystery, like a vice documentary. <laughs> Bring delicious tacos back. I never, I never did have delicious tacos on. He only talks with chicks. Uh, do you remember David D'Angelo? I was never a big fan of that. Carl liked him better. I literally, like, I was literally just mystery, the DVD set, and then I just went off. I didn't dive deep into the lore. I didn't study 18,000 books. It was the one thing, and then 90% of my pickup hobby was just field field experience. That was it. Picking up girls. So I didn't have time. I was sailing 189 days out of the year. And then on top of that, still working a nine to five plus duty watches every two weeks. I had zero free time. So I didn't need two years to study. I need to basically capitalize on the small amount of free time I had in foreign ports and that. Tell mystery you're a stan. I don't know. Well, that's the other part is I don't want to meet him because I'm like, I kind of know he's got, he had some like emotional stuff in his youth. So I'm like, do I want to meet this guy and get disappointed? Probably not. It's weird when Infinite Lewis will peace from your city. There's a few. Apparently Elton John lives here too. Jordan Peterson I know lives here. At least he used to. Uh, keynote speaker at StoneCon is Mystery. <laughs> mystery, Roycey, and Banky were the OGs. Look at this. They used to do infields at a fruit, mar a fruit market. That's impressive. Ty Lopez was hanging out with him during COVID. I don't know. See how this stuff is kind of fun. But that's the thing now. Mystery's got to be in like his mid... I think he's like Rolo's age, so he's got to be mid-50s. So. Most likely wouldn't be the same. Eh, that's fine. Anyways, we're... Uh, what do we have for time here? We're at the one hour and 30 minute mark. We're going to go back into this one. So another red-pilled story, and this is the guy I talk about a lot. D Wine More Please knows exactly who I'm talking about. It's this guy. He was in the married red pill. He's not notable. He didn't provide like some crazy theories or some essays or anything like that. It was, it was just, I would call him the template. His name, he, the name he went by was the Litz. And he was there week in, week out. Like, I know we always said that, yeah, that's great. Everybody loves to be able to say, I just did this red pill theory on this. And I wrote an essay on that. And that's fine. He didn't do any of that shit. No pretense. All he did was week in, week out. He would sit in. Uh, he would sit in the own your shit weekly threads and he would just do field reports. That was it. It was literally like how I was doing the pickup back in the day. He didn't care about all the theory and all this stuff. He learned what he needed to learn and he just applied it as best he could. And it was awesome to watch because he was a uh, I don't even remember much about his original story, but he was an older guy. He was with his wife dead bedroom, out of shape, you know, the very standard stock story. Kind of in a dead, dying bedroom, quiet life of, of desperation, that sort of stuff. And so he's like, okay, so I'm doing the workouts now. And then he found out, you know, his joints are getting old, the workouts are getting hard, he's doing his best on those, he's seeing his limitations, he's seeing his weaknesses, and he's making progress. It's great. 
and it, uh, I think he had like his was it his wife was an alcoholic or he was an alcoholic or want pills, all these kinds of like horrible situations, right? That's very normal. Like there's a lot of people right now that are addicted to painkillers or SSRIs or booze or smoking. And he had a whole bunch of stories like this. His wife was very anxious and neurotic and needed therapy. And he had his things. And so most of his reports were just self-reflective. It was literally OODA. He would observe his environment. He would uh, orient himself towards an ideal outcome. He would make a decision to get him there. And then he would act on it. And then he would reflect by observing how did it work? Did it work well? Did it work not? If anything, the only fault I could have for it is he was maybe a little too self-reflective. Because that's, that's a problem a lot of guys run into is where they internalize all of the fault. And sometimes it's shit that's out of your control. So it's not your fault. Sometimes it is literally just your wife's being a bitch. Or the environment makes it so like it's not going to happen any other way. It's not your fault. There's nothing you can do about it. But he would rather err on the side of accountability. And he had two field reports that I remember pretty well. Where he would like a year in review. And it was funny because week in, week out, it didn't look as like he's writing the same thing every week is what it looked like. Because the, the progress was incremental. It was slow. And he didn't really notice anything. But then when he went back and looked back over the year, it, it really is that saying. You know, the one where uh, you'll be surprised how little you can get done in a week, but how much you can get done in a year. I think it was something like that. I'm probably getting it wrong. But it was neat. And then he's like, yeah, so he, he came overcame a lot of the drug stuff, the alcohol stuff, the working out stuff was good. He's in better shape, you know, medical issues because they're older, but you know, things got dealt with. He had a very realistic appraisal. He realized like his life was substantially better. No Bugatti, no uh, tight 20 year old blowing him in the thing and no three, like none of that shit. It was just life was here. Now it's here. And after 12 months, that's pretty good. And so the, again, the next year, same thing, just, you know, when I were working on this, getting my mental models in check, Becoming his own shrink, realizing like, oh, a lot of this stuff is me trying to caretake for my wife. And I really can't do that. Like she has to want to do it herself. And then he did do his second year. And the second year, the reason I loved it, the reason I loved it was because he kind of, I could tell he was kind of talking to himself about what kind of outcome he wanted. And this is, nobody ever knows what their goals are, by the way. When I always say have a goal, achieve a goal, that's great. But nobody knows what they have as their goals. They think they do. But it changes so quickly once a guy gets his shit together. And so for him, it was about, I'm going to fix this marriage. Then it was like, I'm going to fix me. And now it's like, what trade-offs am I willing to make for the rest of my life? And he kind of had a moment where he's like, like, she's not going to get she's the way that she is. I can't change it. I can run dread all day. But like, she's got a capability and she's at her plateau right now. And I'm not saying she was bad. She was actually pretty good. But she wasn't amazing. She was good five mid whatever and so it was him kind of discussing with himself like is it worth it to stick with this do i want to separate and just like you know go there i'll probably get new i'll probably get better that'll be great and but it was just nice because he was sitting there almost negotiating with himself what kind of life do i actually want to live and it was like vision it was watching a guy carve out a vision and it's not some big ostentatious i'm the greatest man on earth and i'm gonna conquer the new york city and it was just like my life is here I can be here or here. And then him just kind of figuring it out. And it was great. And then he kind of left and did his own thing. And it was perfect. I loved it. To this day, he is my absolute favorite. Pen name, pseudonyme, pseudonymous guy. I have never described to you any mental model that he's described. No essay that he's written. I don't even think I've described, the, talked about the field reports. I'm writing about it. It's going to be part of in dread because I just love it as a roadmap. And I've had all of his stuff there and I've read through them probably five times now. But that's why I liked it because it was, and I always tell you guys, I would love if the red pill was just like a C-SPAN, Senate hearing, boring, dry, informational lecture with information. Yes, I get it. There's like a loaded morality, you know, spurginess to the side of it. Some stuff sounds rather autistic because it's overly literal. You're talking about things that are supposed to be unspoken out loud, which is never going to be socially appropriate. It never is never is going to be appropriate but it was just great because it was if you could make red pill a trade like masonry or carpentry or writing or whatever he would be like journeyman's train under him 
This is exactly what you're supposed to do. This is the baseline level of information. This is exactly how you're supposed to run your thing, stripped of all like emotional content. It was just wonderful. And the more boring and dry and, and self-critical it was, the better I found it. It was just awesome. Uh, just through an ad is your live. I hear, yeah, YouTube starting to add their own ads to live streams now. Yeah, men have two moods, self-improvement and remembering. Eh, fair. Uh, saw the stupid stuff that Coach Red Pill did again, trying to escape Ukraine. Oh, is he still there? Dude, I am surprised he hasn't found himself in a ditch yet. Like, what a fucking idiot. Uh, I'll give you guys a hint. If you're going to start talking shit during a conflict, go to the country that you're not talking shit about. Try living there for a bit. Especially the Slavs, because they don't do the rule of law shit. It's not like America at war with Vietnam. You're allowed to talk shit about... No. You don't go to Ukraine and talk about Ukraine's a bunch of dicks. You got to do that shit from Romania. <laughs> yeah, let's talk sponsorship. Who funds this channel? Why are we talking sponsorship? Are you my fucking manager, Dr. Manhattan? Give me a sec here. Is this a Billy? Let me see something. Uh-huh. Pew, pew. Nobody funds this channel. Oh, because of the ads. All right, I'll unhide you then. Fuck it. I think I unhit him. Do I edit my own clips? Uh, I was doing some... Oh, yeah, so I guess... Oh, do you guys really want to talk about this stuff? It's kind of annoying, but... So, Mish had this great idea. He's like, you should start getting into shorts, do TikToks. I'm like, really? I, I don't know. Because I tried it before. It's a lot of effort. And TikToks, like, if they, even if they do get good views, and some do, they don't really monetize well. They don't grow the channel. Like, there's no... I don't know what the ROI is for them. Other than, well, TikTok's doing it. You should do it. He's like, yeah, well, look. And he did some examples. There's this program called opus what the fuck was it called one sec i gotta pull it up opus opus clip and he's like yeah ai will go through your content like you give it a thing you get so many hours per month to use and give them 100 bucks or whatever and they'll grab what they think are the best clips out of your content i'm like all right i'll give it a shot for a month so i ran it for a month and i ran shorts on tiktoks on the gaming channel and on this channel and after a month i look back and it's like didn't really do anything. I don't get massive subscriber boosts. It's not super engaging. Revenue wise, it's not great. The TikTok is like, I don't know, it's just not, for, it's not geared to my style of content. So I'm probably going to stop doing them, but I don't have enough time to like make my own clips, which may be better. And that's true, but I got, I got shit to do, man. So I hope you guys enjoyed them because they're probably not coming back. Uh, Rolo has his Devil Mountain coffee. So I just wondered, oh, that, yeah, um, I tried it. I don't like that either. Like I was doing, and uh, what was the coffee brand? Watch some of my old red pill coffees. I can't remember what the name was, but I tried them. And for most of the sponsorships, it's just. So for example, if I do an ad read for something on a channel, it actually drops my viewership. Like people just check out as soon as you do those ad reads. So I, I get why guys like Mr. Beast just don't do them. And then for a lot of them, there's a couple different types. There's one where it's like an affiliate. So if you buy the thing using my link, I get a uh, kickback, which is one way of doing it, which is fine, I guess. And then the other one is they just give you a flat fee. You run video, like you make a video for them. It's like an, it's like natural guerrilla marketing. So like, Hey, here's the new iPhone and, and Apple pays you to do a 10 minute video on the iPhone. Casey Neistat does a lot of those. And then the third one is where they just pay you a set amount and you do the ad read on their thing. Again, I'm finding on it, maybe it's just a size thing, but uh, it's not really, like the money you make from it isn't really worth the hit you take to engagement, I find. Maybe if you're super big. And then there's always, you have to do the research into it. You got to make sure, because some people just shill anything. They don't care, but I'm like, I worked fucking hard to build a reputation as somewhat trustworthy. And I don't like the idea of I'm going to shill a fleshlight and now everybody's going to, I'm going to like that reputation took a lot of effort and I'm not selling it for a $2,000 ad read. Fuck that. Yeah. I liked Lloyd's made the channel feel more elegant. Yeah. Well, Lloyd's is like an off brand thing, which I kind of liked. I didn't have a name for anything else where it wasn't a red morning. Wasn't a rule zero. It was just Lloyd's coffee house. I'll probably start doing those again too. Need another chick chalk. 
Yeah, I've still got it, dude. There's a folder in my thing of like 170 TikToks that I haven't TikToked yet. And a Manosphere Morning. Apparently you guys loved that shit, which I I meant it almost as like a satire of the format. And I'm like, there's no way anybody likes this. All I'm doing is making a video of how I tweet. And you guys are like, these are awesome. <laughs> like, why? No, they're not. All I did was laugh at a guy for saying you should hate your kids on Christmas. Um, on points, I could go back to them. On point was just me going through ro old Roycey stuff. That's all that was. Oh, did I crack my glass? Oh, no, that's just the edge. Yeah, it was this old Roycey stuff. I could probably go back to it now that his stuff is back up. But yeah. TikToks are like the cool version of Ribby. Well, that was the point for those. Because I saw everybody was just doing whaminate shit TikToks. Where they, even Matt Walsh did one. He always just puts troons on the thing and then shakes his head and does this. And I'm like, all these guys are watching TikToks of chicks acting like hoes and then yelling at them. And I thought, why don't I just do like a satirical take on them where I do that, but I give it the same tone as as an old 80s Miller Lite commercial. You know what I mean? Like ski, like a ski bro, like police academy. It's all fun. It's games. Oh, tits are awesome. Women ain't shit. And that was the plan for that one. But I don't think anybody picked up on the satire. I think they just took it at face value. It's like, dude, this is like way better than Ribby. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> An April Fool's Red Pill episode, he's cranky. Fair enough. Anyway, so that's it for this one. I guess we got some time for Bants. It's only hour 40. We can do like an hour 50. <laughs> me, like me and Taylor the Fiend. Oh, yeah, dude. I think that's the problem with it. I don't, like, I don't care about misogyny. I don't, if you want to shit on women, it's your business. It doesn't really bother me. I don't get offended by it. I'm not thinking, salt is great. Or, like, whatever. Fuck off. The part that gets me about it is it's so derivative. There's no entertainment value. The guy's not interesting. And I don't understand why people watch it. I think I caught, like, I watched like a minute. I get about a minute into it and I'm like, I'm fucking done. It's somebody autistically talking into the camera. Some, You know what it is? Did you, uh, I, there's that guy who was just blocked by Rolo. The Think Before You Sleep was a, I guess he's a bigger YouTube channel. A MGTOW guy. And Rolo Brock blocked him. And then he put a screenshot of the block up and then did this long screed about, look at how butthurt he is, this, butthurt, that. And then it was just like 4,000 word diatribe about how Rolo is sensitive and has hurt feelings and can't take criticism or something. And I was like, I ain't reading all that, bro. <laughs> I don't think anybody's reading all that. Glad you got it out of your system, though. Uh, Dark Knight Dev, heartfelt fuck you in the super chats. Red Pill will never be C-SPAN because guys want to follow dudes who holds girl accountable instead of chasing kid diddlers for clout and dollars. I hate this space. Well, look at the bright side, Dev. Space is over. The boys got demonetized. Did you not see? All right. Ah, I, I, oh, fuck it. I can't. Okay. I'm, yeah. One and done. So the word through the grapevine. Oh, just so you know, uh, Fresh and Fit got removed from the, the channel partner program or whatever. I'm like, oh, that sucks. You know, whatever. And then somebody sent me a link to, I guess they had their emergency podcast to talk about it. And I was, and I was like, I just like made some jokes on it uh, on Twitter. I normally don't watch any of the videos. I just like look at the screen cap and the title. Like I, I'm Reddit. I read the article title and I'm pretty sure I got the gist of it. And 99% of the time I'm right. So finally, after like seeing it the 15th time, I'm like, all right, let's try it. I actually, I actually clicked. I clicked my first link to a fresh and fit video was this one. And it started off with Myron and Walter. Guys, something is very serious. We thought we needed to tell you first. Um, we're broke. And then it was like, cue the intro. And it was, take it to the limit. That scene from Scarface. And they're driving Bugattis and pulling up to the clubs and throwing all this bling around. I'm like, holy fuck. If I was going to write a satire to this, this fresh and fit telethon, this is exactly what I would do. Hi, guys. We're broke. We need the money. And then just like jets flying in and supermodels everywhere. <laughs> I laughed my ass off. I, I couldn't watch it anymore. Like, I, I'm done. I can't. I can't. I guess they were crying about how they're here to save men and this stuff. And they need your money. And I was like, holy fuck. Now that sounds like an evangelical, like Tammy Faye Baker crying with her mascara running. Jesus needs every dollar you can send. And I was like, holy fuck. And I don't know. If, maybe they were getting money from it. But for me, I was like. I can't, I can't satirize this. You can't, you can't satirize the unsatirizable. That's that, that is the satire. And I'm like, 
do I do I have like a newfound respect from the fresh and fit business model because they actively are aware of like how ridiculous the whole thing is? Or is this just like unaware? Like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> just go for it. I don't even know. I don't even know. He's not MGTOW. He's Brittany Venti's boyfriend now. This is going to be fun. I would just, Let me know how it goes. I've decided to not engage. I've been blocking everybody. I blocked the Hammerhead squad. I blocked Cuckboy. That's, I don't want I don't want anybody sending me emails asking about underage nudes and shit. I'm like, I don't need that fucking level of stress in my life. I have plenty of content. I don't need to go on that. Uh, with their grifty gumroad courses they sold, they should have enough money to retire. Well, that's my and that was my only question with the guys. I'm like, so are they did they at least have a like did anybody advise them on having a fucking savings account? Because you had to have known this gravy chain wasn't gonna last forever. And I'm like, they're making like, and I guess they checked the things. They were the most super chat. They're getting like 30,000 in super chats a week. So 30,000 a week, 52 weeks a year, doing it for two years, two, three years. That's like $3 million. Now, the two guys, you can run insane bling for two people, a million dollars. You can live off of that and live the large high life and still have a million dollars each then to go retire off of. If I find out they're really fucking broke, I'm like, how the fuck do you waste $3 million? You're in the same studio you started on. It's not like you moved to a new bigger warehouse or something. I know one of them bought like a Bugatti or some shit, but even that's only a quarter of a mil. How do you broke? And then like, if they're broke, I remember, cause that was always the big justification whenever uh, everybody, I'm like, yeah, the white claw power hour shit. It's not helpful. It's not useful. And everybody's like, well, they do other stuff too. They have a great finance bro. App. And I'm kind of wondering now, now that they're doing the I am broke, can I please has the money telethon? Is anybody looking back on their financial literacy episodes thinking, is that really the advice I want to follow? I don't think so. I don't think anybody's got the, uh, I mean, nobody really cared. They just want it as an excuse anyway, so I get it. But I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't wish them ill. I'm laughing at it. Don't get me wrong. I'm having a great old time. Like you guys have been fucking up the red pill for years. And for once, you I get to watch you fuck up your brand instead of my brand and it feels nice so i don't wish them to be poor or broke but i really do hope they save some money because it's like bro you can't but i mean whatever tate's showing you you can sanitize whatever that was the other one i was like oh my god he's on with some shrink who's apparently a big channel which i've never heard of before but uh yeah it's not been a crazy time it's like yeah man fame can't make it on without breaking some eggs and they were talking about it like remember that time we got stuck in the mud and we had to get ourselves out but he's talking about like money laundering yeah it's it's crazy the adventure sometimes you end up and you end up here it's, wow i was like what the fuck am i doing here you can just do that you can just say you can just talk about this stuff like a nostalgic romp through the hay and not go to jail is like is that what you can do hey right, fair enough you think it's kayfabe they're asking for five dollar subs oh they probably are i mean whatever I know, like I said, I like I like sitting afar from it, having some dark humor about it. I love chucking shit at it because, well, if they're going to ruin the red pill, at least I might as well have some fun with it. But I don't want to invest that much. Is Fresh and Fit broke or am I running Fresh broke? I don't even know. The new Bugatti is up to 5 mil. The McLaurin could be 25, 250. Oh, fair enough. Why would you pay 5 million for a car? Unless you have like 50 million, there's no point. <laughs> Who do they think they are? Mike Tyson? Yeah, Fresh and Fit have good financial advice on how they save some money. Well, I mean, how good was the financial advice? They just lost a million dollar a year channel. I mean, whatever. I don't want to make it sound like I'm a hater. I'm just, I'm just baffled by the entire situation. I really am. It makes no sense to me. Anyways, even with 50 million a year, you don't buy a 5 million car. Yeah, drama sells. What if Ryan invented Billy to increase beer? Dude, that would be horrible. Anyways, I'm going to end on this. So we got one more story here. I'll give you uh, who wants a good laugh. So I'm sending you two tweets. One more please did this. This one's this one's more of like phoned in content last minute, but he kind of just got sent up on my doorstop. So we're going to do it there. So. It's a Reddit thing. What's my computer set up? I got two monitors and a computer. And then a camera and another camera. And a microphone. It's pretty it. It was funny because I just saw this. I was like, uh, 
I don't know, go after those Elon bucks, right? So I found an old a Reddit post that came out recently or a girl got divorced, remarried quickly, and now she's pregnant. It was all a mistake. And it was like, it was perfect because it was vague enough. I knew people could fill it up with whatever. A girl found her teenage sweetheart, got married. They lived, they, uh, 15 years or something, they were married. And then how did she put it? When we decided we just didn't feel the love anymore and he left, which meant she wasn't happy and she divorced him. Then being single for the first time since high school, I went out and had some fun. Like, obviously know what this means. Then I met the guy I clicked with. We got together. I proposed. He was a Mormon guy, got married, and now she's 32 weeks pregnant. And now she realizes I hate all of this and I miss my ex. And I was like, what a great revenge story. The virginal high school sweetheart got bored, fear of missing out, divorces her husband, gets knocked up by another guy after fucking around a bunch of dudes. And now she regrets all of it. And then Wymore Police sent that second one, which is funny too. They, they met the Mormon husband, drinking, sleeping together, then moved in, knocked him down in the church. So he married her, so he get like a thing in the church, and now she's pregnant. It's just fucking funny. Now here's the best part about this stuff. Obviously, you can tell I'm pretty. It's like eh, I get the story. Yeah, girl thought she was missing out, realizes the grass was better on the other side, and now she regrets her choices. And she's going to blame everybody else but herself. But it's like great bait engagement. I do want to say this, though. Like, as a guy, this is why I hate that whole, well, just sleep with your teenage sweetheart as a virgin. It's like, that's not going to, didn't help this one. This chick got bored and then decided to move on and then fucked a bunch of dudes, got pregnant to a Mormon, and now she hates her life. It's like, that's very possibly what could happen if you do everything right by the TradCon thing. I'm not saying it will happen. I am saying, though, that that risk is there. So maybe looking for your virginal wife isn't going to be the solution. All it is is just going to lead you to a life of misery. And that's all you can really focus on. Like the ex-husband, I guess he got remarried, has a family, and he's doing fine. And that's all he focused on. What do I need to do to make my life better? And I, I do, even though I shit post and I talk shit and I'm like, ah, Tate's a moron and Brittany's a moron and all. I get it. I'm, I'm acerbic. I'm argumentative. I take nothing seriously unless it's needed to be taken seriously. I, I find everybody in this space is almost without exception is an absolute joke, talentless hack. They're not entertaining. They're not engaging. They're people I wouldn't piss on if they were on fire. And I'm pretty sure a lot more of them are gay than you think. <laughs> pretty sure. The ones that aren't on drugs anyway. Finding out that Jack Murphy was taking Ambien and Scotch to sleep was like, holy fuck. Finding out that Destiny was like accidentally taking meth before work. And I was like, Jesus Christ, what is wrong with people? Like, I get all that. But underneath all of this thing, there is like a little fundamental thing. It's that you're here for you. Nobody gives a shit about you, you know, and they're going to work by law, by force, by coercion <coughs> to get you to do what they want. And so all you have to do is ask yourself a fundamental question is what do I want out of life? And if somebody wants something from me, am I, am I getting paid market value for this? Like, am I not being taken for granted? And if you can get to there, if you can get to that point where you're nothing else matters, but you making sure you're not being taken for granted, you have that assertiveness, you have the boundary enforcement, you accept that, you know, sometimes, yeah, my high school wife decided she wanted some dick, so we were done. That's fine. You move on, get a younger girl. It's great. It sucks. You're probably going to cry for a couple days, but you fucking get over it, right? So if you can get to that level of ambivalence towards all of this fucking clown show nonsense, and focus on the shit that really matters to you, which, you know, for me, it's getting the books out, it's doing the podcast, it's doing my work, it's it's having something that, and I, I hate the phrase, but it works here, at the end of the day, having something that I can look at and point to and go, that's something I created, and that's good enough for me. And then, you know, good times with the old lady. And if you guys can get there from the work that I've done, I think I'll have done a good job. Not because I particularly like you, not because I want to see you succeed, but because I was always that guy. I hate showing up to work and being that fucking guy. I've never wanted to be that fucking guy. Even if it's a job I hate, it's like, I don't want to be that guy that somebody's like, oh, Ryan's here. And then they roll their eyes because they're like, oh, I don't want to be that guy. And so luckily for you, you guys getting information to make your life somewhat better, build frame, boundaries, red pill, all that stuff, entertain, sure. All that stuff is there. It's a byproduct of it. And I hope you take advantage because this ain't going to be here forever because, yeah, yesterday, fresh and fit, got nuked. Who knows tomorrow? They may be like, this red morning is too 
bad for the YouTube brand and they'll shut me down too. And then I, no word of a lie, shamelessly will make the exact same PBS telethon that he was making. Guys, I've been canceled by the woke mob. Q intro. And there'll be a picture of me sailing around the world and throwing money with a money gun. And like, guys, this channel only works with the support of you guys and sponsored by the letters A and X and the numbers one, two, and three. We need your money more than ever because I am here to help, man. I'll give that same speech because, like, fuck it. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, enjoy yourselves. Let's end off. Okay, I'll do one shit talk. One shit talk. Uh, what the hey? The classics never go out of style. Ian, what do uh, not Ryan Stone? I'm, I think he's the most important guy in the world. Ryan Stone. Give a fuck about Ryan Stone. Me and him have gone back and forth. Blah blah. Yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a fuck what Ryan Stone. Seventy nine T twenty four fifty eight Learning Corp Little Red Riding Hood Take One. Uh -huh.